Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Today we need to make a small steel container for our forge welding operation to build this blade out of. This is going to give us a zero atmosphere forge weld and it will contain all of the components that this blade is going to be made out of. So I've got some mild steel plate here with some mild steel 3 8 square rod and I need to weld this all together. We'll just run a bead down the seam there doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, I like to leave some minor pinholes in the weld and on the rare occasion that I actually get it welded up airtight, I would actually have to go ahead and put a vent hole in there. This is the 3 8 round 01 tool steel rod that is going to comprise most of the blade here. That's what's going to be the cutting edge and we'll combine that in our can, in our canister here. Before we go any further, I'm using white spray paint to coat the inside of the canister and that keeps it from welding to our O1 tool steel rod and other components. So I'm using a marker to put a pattern here on the center four rods here. And it's an alternating pattern as you can see. And I'm gonna use the KMG grinder here to work on our O1 tool steel rods. This is the tilting model and this is going to be handy. It's going to allow me to hold the uh, steel rods in a much more ergonomic fashion and put some grooves in each one where I've marked them. Now I've got to keep all these rods indexed properly so that our alternating pattern stays where it, where it needs to be. So now that that's been completed and we've also cleaned up the, the outer this larger diameter of these rods, I'll go ahead and wipe them down with WD-40 to make sure there's no moisture and no dust on them and put them in our can here. Next I'm going to add some 1080 powdered steel that has 4% nickel powder in it. What this is going to do is provide a nice contrast between our O1 tool steel rod and the powdered steel. The nickel in the powdered steel is going to maintain a bright appearance after we etch the pattern on the finished blade. So I'm just going to tap this generously here to make sure that all the powder is settled down around the voids in our can. Weld up the top so that we've got a sealed, well mostly sealed can and then put it in the forge. Now you'll notice as you put your can in the paint starts to burn off of the inside and you've got a different colored flame coming out of one of the spots in your welds if it's vented. I always watch for this because if that didn't happen I would need to put a vent hole in. So we use the press to go ahead and squish this down multiple times get it up to forge welding heat multiple times and we'll put it on the bias here and forge that down as well. Squish those rods together make sure we have a good forge weld on this whole billet before we move on. After several passes, I can go ahead and begin removing the canister. And this is relatively simple to do. I just want to be careful I don't cut into the O1 tool steel rod, just into the mild steel 3 8 bar that we have around the outside. The can should not be welded to the contents, of course, because of our white paint. It's the titanium dioxide content in the paint that creates that non-welding barrier and in my experience that's the best method for using when you're doing a canister Damascus project. So there's our billet and uh, it will come out pretty easily just the edges being um, squished into the can a little bit but no actual fusing whatsoever. So we'll heat the can or heat the billet back up here and start working it down on the power hammer a little bit going going nice and easy to start out with. This is O1 tool steel. It is a little more finicky than a lot of steels on the forge welding temperature. If you forge it too cold it does uh, tend to crack easier. But I've got the bar work down here and now I can go ahead and cut out a v-shape in the end. This is going to be the tip of the knife and what I'm doing here is creating a forge weld that will bring all of those tool steel rods together 
at the end of the knife here. And I want to put a little bit of a chamfer on those uh, on those edges there. Another way you could do this is to simply forge one edge up around, and so you would bring those uh, those rods all the way up around the curve. This is another way of doing it, which is a little fancier and kind of a neat way to do it. So get some flux on there and then start closing this up. This isn't quite up to forge welding heat. I just want to make sure it's fluxed nicely and uh, get that closed up slowly. And then once we have it together, we can bring it up to forge welding heat and set the weld for sure on that. Now you can do this one of two ways. You can leave that weld in the center of the blade in the very tip of the knife. I prefer to choose one side for the edge versus the other and then forge the tip up around so that the uh, the weld line is actually up at the back of the spine of the knife, so to speak, at the very end. And you can see where I've done that on the tip there. Brush a little uh, borax off of there, a little flux off of there, and we're going to forge in the tang of this blade. It's going to be a hidden tang knife, and the power hammer makes short work of this. Trying to keep everything even. Now, now that we've got the tang established, I'm going to go ahead and put a counter bend into the blade so we can begin forging in the bevel. The reason for this is as I forge the bevel, it's going to spread the material on one side of the knife and essentially straighten the blade back out as you're seeing here. Being careful to work this at a good forging heat. 01 tool steel is a great steel. It's not the main steel that I use, but one of the things about it is that it is not as forgiving in the forging as a lot of other steels when it comes to the temperature. So you have to be a little more mindful of that. So we're getting pretty close here, getting just the uh, final finishes done on the bevel, keeping everything centered and even as much as possible here. And then we can go ahead and flatten it out a little bit and do the straightening on it. So there's the blade all forged up and straightened, ready to move on to the next stage of the process, except for the fact that if you'll notice right at the tip there, on the point of the knife, we've got a little issue. The very end of our V-weld did not come together. That's pretty typical. The very ends of that V just are so thin that they can't hold the heat, and uh, it's hard to get pressure on them adequately to actually forge weld them together. The rest of the weld's fine though. So we'll go ahead and cut that off with the uh, angle grinder and just forge that uh, tip up around a little bit more. All right, so the finishing touches on the forging process, getting it all straightened back up. We'll go ahead and begin the heat treat process, which of course is multiple steps to bring out the best characteristics of the steel for this blade. First of which, of course, is normalizing. We'll go ahead and let this cool and still air and then move forward with the rest of the processes. At this point the blade is about ready to go into the quench and so before I do that I'm going to go ahead and refine the profile and do a rough grind on it. I've got quite a bit of stock on this blade still. I left it quite a bit thicker than I normally do during the forging process just to be able to grind down to where I want to on the pattern. Now I'm not sure exactly if I left it a little bit thicker than I should have but better to have a little more material than not enough. So. We'll get this quenched and hardened, and then we can temper it.
We're all tempered up and we can go ahead and finish grind this blade using my KMG Classic. I've got hundreds of hours on this grinder and feel right at home with it. This blade is a fairly thick spine. It's uh, about a quarter inch at the Ricasso. And then we'll put in a distal taper to the blade as well. As I was grinding this, I saw, found a little uh, line on our V-weld there and uh, was able to get that out, but ground more, ground the thin thickness of the end of the blade a little more than I wanted to. Do a little belt change there, and we'll get this up to 220 grit before I start hand sanding on it. The continuous problem with grinding is the dust containment. My current method is to have a little containment uh, structure there, which maybe needs a better door. It works fairly well. You have to have good PPE though, of course. There's our finished ground blade and looking pretty good overall. And we'll, we'll be able to move on to the next step here, hand sanding. First thing I'm gonna do is go up to 220 grit and then I am gonna stop right there and we're gonna do some testing on this blade before we move on. I put a convex edge bevel on this knife and stropped it on the buffing wheel. Got a nice razor sharp edge on there, nice polished edge. And it is very sharp, shaves very easily. So that's good to go. And we've got, I've got some uh, two by threes here, straight from Idaho Forest, of course. And uh, got my lanyard backwards on the blade here. I had to adjust that here in just a second. <laughs> But anyway, we're going to go ahead and chop through this several times and test the edge holding capability of this blade. All total, I went through this 2x3 four times. And you'll see this in uh, sped up time here. I like to show the entire testing footage unedited, just sped up of course. I'm happy to say that it shaved very easily all up and down the blade following the testing. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and hand sand the blade up to 600 grit, which is not as high as I'm gonna go, but I want to go ahead and fit the guard before I go any higher. Use my uh, file guide here to uh, grind in the uh, shoulders on the Ricasso. I can't really recommend doing this this way. It's easy to catch the belt and, and, and uh, ruin it and start flying around like that, but it is effective, at least I found it to be effective. So we've got a piece of brass here and we'll fit that up to the shoulders on the Ricasso for our guard and uh, includes drilling and filing and fitting and there we go. So I want a decent guard on this, nothing too big or too crazy but a nice double guard. So I'll use the two inch contact wheel to start shaping this and taking material off of the guard. It's a three quarter by three quarter square brass chunk here and uh, takes a little bit of material to remove that. So there we go into the etch, we're up to 800 grit and uh, while that's in the in and out of the ferric chloride a few times, I'm gonna go ahead and start working on the spacers for the handle that are gonna go in between the guard and the desert ironwood handle that's going on this knife. This is black paper micarta. Finishes out nice and clean looking. Makes a good spacer material. All right, so we've got the blade out of the etch and that's good to go so we can go ahead and mark out where we need to fit the tang into the desert ironwood block. So you see how far down the tang is actually going in the handle. 
got that drilled out and I will use the burn-in method to to get this fit up and then clean it out with the drill bit a little bit more till we have a good fit. So we'll go ahead and assemble this whole handle together and so you've got a pretty tight fit in the tank slot to begin with and any voids will be filled up with epoxy there. I'd, I'd rather have a little extra epoxy than not enough. So we'll get that fit together nice and tight and get it put together in our clamp and let the epoxy cure overnight. This is not how I wanted to start off the final day of this knife build. But that is not supposed to look like that. The grain structure looks pretty good. So what happened is, is last night I took this in the house. Because it's cold out here and the epoxy doesn't set up when it's cold. So I brought it in the house to warm it up. And I had it in the uh, clamp just like this with my chunk of wood up here at this end and you know the angle on the end of this wood here is a little bit off so I was trying to make sure that wherever this was sitting was going to make sure that it was going to push that block of wood straight down onto the spacer so we didn't have any gaps so I was fiddling with it and these clamps here which is what I've been using for clamping most of my hidden tang knives while they set up is actually it's it's been a it's been pretty fiddly ever since I've done that, and the longer the knife you get here, it seems like it can get more wobbly. But here, what what we have here is this swivel, the swiveling foot here. It's not stationary. It's not rigid, and so I had this block of wood, not this one, but one just like it, like so. And if you get this off center, it starts. It just it just goes off and pops right out because of the tension on it. So if you can imagine that pushing that up the way it, if you don't have it just perfectly centered, this this nasty little swivel thing here just flops over to the side, and that's exactly what happened. I was I was kind of trying to tweak it just a little bit, and pow, just popped it right off. So unfortunately, we don't have the original blade design that we wanted that i wanted here and the worst part about that is that my lines here with those rods in the billet they all were meeting in a specific spot like they were supposed to now we're just going to have to grind right through that next thing i'm going to do is rough shape the handle the profile on the handle mainly because i want to take a measurement as to the center of the handle where this uh pin is going to go that I'm going to put in and so I want to shape that a little bit so I can index where that pin should go. So I'll drill this out with an eighth inch drill bit first and then a 5 30 seconds bit and put a 5 30 seconds brass rod through there epoxied in. Now I can drill through the tang easily because I did uh, spheridize that earlier just bring it up to a real dull red with the torch and let it cool and it makes it soft enough to drill through. So our pin has been epoxied in and that's been cured so we can go ahead and start shaping the handle. So we went ahead and did what I think is a reasonable tip test on the new blade profile there. And we'll get this guard and handle all sanded up and buffed out and getting a lot closer to being done here. Now 
All right, we've got some photographs of the finished product here. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, don't forget that you can support the channel for free simply by hitting like, leaving a comment, subscribing, enabling the notifications. Stay tuned for an after action review here at the end of the video, and I will critique this build. As always, I appreciate you guys watching, and we'll see you on the next video. All right, well, one of the challenges in the blacksmithing or bladesmithing uh, trade when it comes to YouTube is the type of content that you put out. And what I mean by that is, you know, building a knife like this or any kind of blacksmithing or bladesmithing project is very time intensive. There's a lot of work. I spent uh, four days on this. And, uh, you know, if you think in terms of what most of us spend four days on, and that's not the only thing I did. I worked on some other stuff too, but that's how long it took me to, to complete this. So really the challenge is getting a video made, uh, getting enough videos made. And um, if you're doing a very time intensive or labor intensive project, which this could be more so if I had some more details and stuff to it, then you know there's sort of a disparity there. So one of the things that I have uh, capitalized on a little bit is trying to think of really neat ideas that don't take as much time to produce and uh, these uh, thin canister type builds have uh, have done okay, done fairly well in some cases for that. And so you get a neat pattern out of it, a neat project, but it doesn't take as much time as say, you know, a full-blown uh, uh, multi-layer mosaic pattern welded Damascus steel blade, which there's a lot of, you know, a lot of merit to those as well. And something that you know I'd like to do in the future as well so you know balancing that between the time input and making something that people actually want to watch there's a lot to it it's just it's not easy um, all that to say this is my most recent um, foray into these thin canisters that I developed here and uh, this 01 tool steel rods and so I had an idea that I thought would make a neat pattern and uh, we, we made a knife so uh, first of all what uh, what do I like about the knife? Well, for, I, the, I really like how it performed in the chop test. Um, I, this is 01 tool steel. This is not my main steel, but I have used it a fair amount over the years, especially before I started focusing on 52-100. Uh, and so I do know that it's very capable. And uh, you guys, when I did the chop test, I, we went four times through a two by three, not a two by four, but a two by three, four times. It, uh, it was as if the edge hadn't even been touched. It was, it was that good. And I, I did my heat treat a little bit, left it a little bit harder than I normally do on 01 this time around. And uh, that combined, you know, the heat treat, the total heat treat process, which is multiple steps, combined with the edge geometry, nice convex uh, grind on here, it was um, performed very well. I was, I was you know, very happy and uh, <clears throat> this is this is a good knife <clears throat> so overall you know this is a good knife this will perform well for you know somebody who wants to use it and that's the the thing I like best about it um, the overall pattern design uh, was overall a success um, it's the first time I've done this particular pattern. What I really wanted was what you see here in the Ricasso. I wanted that further, you know, in, in the rest of the blade. And I didn't get that. If I had ground those little grooves in my tool steel rods further down to like maybe an eighth of an inch thick, uh, we would have had that more pronounced pattern through the rest of the blade. Uh, but I'll, also I left it quite thick. Um, to grind, um, to grind down and not knowing exactly where I was going to end up, you know, I wanted to have plenty of material. And so that can, that can come, you know, that can be a help or a hindrance depending on where you're at. And in this case, it was a little bit of a hindrance. I should have maybe forged it down a little bit thinner and stayed on the outer edges of our, of our billet, of our blade 
to see that pattern a little bit better as you do here in the Ricasso. So uh, that, you know, first time ever doing this pattern, you know, it turned out pretty well. And uh, I, I know how I would do it again if I did it, uh, if I did it again to get that pattern more accentuated. As it is, we've got kind of a unique wavy pattern in the blade here and, and a good knife that performs well. So overall, the overall package, the handle is uh, very comfortable. It's a little bit longer. Uh, so, you know, if you have bigger hands or if you wanted to, to scoot back just a little bit, it's got this nice uh, swell on the end here and you can get a little more chopping uh, action on it if you want to. So either way, it's a, it's a nice, uh, nice handle. A desert ironwood, you know, you can't go wrong with desert ironwood. The, uh, the brass and the uh, paper micarta, black paper micarta, goes together nicely. The whole thing, uh, the whole thing came together pretty well. And uh, overall, it's a great knife. You know, the tang comes down to right about here and it's pinned, this thing is not coming apart. Nice tight fit with epoxy in there. So overall, great blade. So what I don't like about it, or what could have gone better. So let's talk about the blade snapping off first because that is uh, not something you ever wanna experience as a bladesmith, uh, but knowing why it happens is more important than anything else so that you can avoid it if necessary in the future. Uh, first of all, I, I, I uh, tapped the blade about half an inch, good half an inch into a chunk of wood. I explained earlier in the video how that snapped off. But when I was grinding the blade, I had a little line on my where my V-weld came together. And I was chasing that line, trying to get it out. So I, I ground the tip thinner than I wanted to. And even though I ended up with a nice distal taper, I could have and should have left the tip a little thicker on that original blade profile. And that would have probably, um, you know, maybe not eliminated, but uh, minimized the chances of that breaking. The fact of the matter is no knife well, I'm not saying no knife, but no knife that cuts well, basically, is designed to drive into a chunk of wood and, and, and bend it over. That's not what knives are for. If you have a knife that can do that without breaking, it means that the tip is very thick and, frankly, isn't going to cut or penetrate well in any kind of actual knife application. Um, you know, in certain, certain areas of the knife world, there, you know, that is the trend for very thick blades. And they, they simply don't have the cutting clearance. They don't cut well, and they're, they're not good knives for that regard, unless what you're using them for is to, you know, do stuff that you shouldn't do with most knives. So I just, you know, every, everybody knows that pretty much. And, um, you know, so it's not about making excuses for why the, the knife broke. The tip was a little bit thin on the grind, uh, but, you know, you could break this tip off too if you wanted to on, on, on any knife, even even the really beefy ones if you push them too far. So I, uh, I made this knife to cut and it does that well and it holds a great edge. And uh, it does have, you know, quarter inch thick spine up here and a nice distal taper. So it's uh, beefier than than some of my knives and it will hold up to some, to some use, but uh, that's why the tip broke and, you know, in the future, and if I want a, I want a knife that's not going to break under those conditions, I can build that, but uh, that's not what I was trying to do here. So, uh, the things I really don't like about this knife right here, my plunge lines are not even side to side, perfectly even, they're, they're off a little bit. Um, the guard is not perfectly even, like so. I think when, you have a, when you're working with a taller piece of of stock that especially on an old drill press you know it can wander and you get that slot in there started at a little bit of an angle if you're not really careful with that then the whole thing goes on just a little bit of an angle everything's fit up nice and tight there's no gaps or anything like that but you look at it and it's at a little bit of an angle and i don't like that but there's nothing i can do about that now um what else i don't know if the handle goes with the blade perfectly or not the handle's really nice the blade's cool does this whole package match? I don't know, that's for the person that, that gets it to decide. Um, that's uh, definitely gonna be a personal preference. I know there's gonna be people out there that love this the way it is and will uh, will love to have it. Something that I do as a bladesmith, as a maker, 
is look at what I've built and you know if you're if you're a bladesmith and you've talked to other bladesmiths you know that this is the way it is you're never satisfied <laughs> and uh, you know on some level you have to be like okay what you know is it good enough is it really good you know what can it do what is it supposed to do and you have to be okay with you know a good tool a good piece of equipment here but on, on the other level as an artisan you're always striving to do better and you're always trying to push yourself and attain another level of proficiency and that's that's what I'm doing here is critiquing my work and I think that's important for a craftsman or an artisan to be able to do um, obviously getting a second pair of eyeballs or a third or fourth opinion that's also helpful but you know I want to be able to personally look at what I've built and say okay you know, this is good, this is good, but this could be better, and I need to work on this next time, etc. So that's what I'm doing here, and I'm taking you guys along for the uh, for the experience. Um, one thing I will say is that the uh, fit-up on this guard here is probably the best one that I've ever done. It, one of the best that I've ever done. It came together really well. There were some things that did come together very nicely on this build, and that is one of them. Very happy with that. There's very 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 clean very tight um, and you know I don't have a step down on that ricasso for that uh, guard to fit up against so you know you have to fit the sides very closely obviously and uh, this one came together really nicely overall this is a one-of-a-kind high functioning blade high functioning knife somebody's gonna get a, get a great blade to keep for a lifetime or more so, learning experience, and uh, we'll continue forging on. So, appreciate you guys watching. We'll see you in the next video.